that this administration will be forcing on the American people after January 1st. So I thank my friend from New York for bringing this issue up, and I yield back the time. Thank you, sir. Well, I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for joining us here tonight. And I, I, in listening to your comments, I wholeheartedly agree that what we're seeing at the end of this year, if Washington, D.C. does not get its act together, and we as the freshman class, I think, are doing a great job in holding this city accountable and really changing the culture of Washington, D.C., the job has just started. We have a lot more work to do, and we'll continue to go forward uh, on that mission. But what we have to commit ourselves to is if we do not act by the end of the year, the largest tax increase in the history of America will go into effect with the expiration of the individual tax rates, the reinstatement of the estate taxes at levels of 55 percent and beyond, and we need to act. And I noticed my, if, my good if, colleague if, from if, Pennsylvania. If you'd yield. I you would. Know, I think the other thing that is very important to understand is that we talk about competing in a global economy. Now, our friends to the north in Canada do not have a death tax. Our friends to the south in Mexico do not have a death tax. This, again, is an example of, a, of an administration that's so out of touch with the real world. That's never had any skin in the game, never understood that. In order to produce a profit, you must first know how to create one. And not just how to tax it, but we are, again, taking ourselves out of the global economy, and we are telling our people, you know what, you may be better off living in Canada or in Mexico, especially if you've accumulated anything in your lifetime, because you're not going to be able to pass it on to the next generation. With that, I yield back to my friend. So appreciate that comment. And uh, with that, I would like to ask another colleague of ours, the, a great member of the freshman class from Florida, uh, Colonel West. Well, I thank the uh, kind colleague of mine from New York, Mr. Reed. And Mr. Speaker, as a field artillery officer in the United States Army, I learned a thing or two about weaponry. Our success on the battlefields of Desert Storm and Desert Shield depended on choosing the correct artillery for each specific objective, whether it was halting the enemy's forward progress, diminishing the strength of his forces, or completely destroying his capabilities. Although he has never served our country in uniform or risked his life to defend its freedoms and liberties on distant shores, it seems President Obama understands a thing or two about weaponry as well. But in the President's case, Mr. Speaker, the current weapon of choice is tax policy. And the enemies are small businesses, investors, entrepreneurs, and corporations who seemingly are deemed undesirable. In short, these are the economic engines of our nation. The President's planned tax increases seem designed solely to demonize the rich and use them as a propaganda tool to score political points. But the collateral damage of these policies will spread far and wide into the heartland of America. After all, the 160 percent increase in federal cigarette taxes put in place in 2009 by President Obama and his administration certainly affects those earning far less than $250,000, despite his promise not to raise their taxes. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, next year, unless changes are made in the tax code, Americans will be bombarded with the heavy artillery of the largest tax increase in the nation's history, causing massive economic injury and discussion, destruction. To begin with, if the Bush-Obama tax rates are allowed to expire, the current tax brackets of 10 percent to 35 percent will rise to 15 percent to 39.6 percent. Other tax provisions scheduled to disappear that will hit ordinary Americans include the American Opportunity Tax Credit, up to $2,500 per student for qualified college costs, tax exclusion for forgiven mortgage debt, and tax credit for employer-provided child care. Children of farmers, as my colleague from Georgia talked about, and small business owners who wish to continue the legacy of their parents will find it increasingly difficult to do so as the death tax exemption will shrink from $5 million to $1 million. Further, inherited assets exceeding that amount will be taxed at a maximum rate, Mr. Speaker, of 55 percent, up from 35 percent and a 5 percent surcharge on estates over $10 million. Investors will be battered with a capital gains tax increase from 15 percent to a maximum of 25.8 percent. Seniors who rely on their dividends returns will also be hammered. 
Stock dividends, currently 15 percent, will be taxed as ordinary income with a top rate of 43.4 percent. That's 39.6 percent income tax plus a 3.8 percent tax on investment income proposed in the President's health care law. In the last few months, we've heard a lot about fairness from the President, Mr. Speaker, especially when it comes to wealthier people. And President Obama's own message about his proposed budget for fiscal year 2013, he says everyone must shoulder their fair share. But how, Mr. Speaker, does he define fair when 47 percent of wage-earning households pay zero federal income taxes, while the top 25 percent of wage-earning households pay 87 percent? Besides, the spending proposed in the President's fiscal year 2013 budget is far beyond what the revenue base can support. It would be mathematically impossible to increase taxes on the nation's highest earners to close the future trillion-dollar-plus deficits if spending continues, as President Obama has planned. And according to a report by the Joint Committee on Taxation, the highly touted Buffett rule would raise a paltry 30 to 40 billion over the next 10 years. Mr. Speaker, during that same time frame, President Obama's budget will create nearly $7 trillion in new debt, which means the Buffett tax would lower that debt by less than half a percent. This is clearly not sound fiscal policy. It's the misguided policy of economic fairness. And it is just as Frederick Bastiat stated in his essay, The Law, it is legal plunder under the guise of benevolence and misconceived philanthropy. While the President has some understanding of the destructive capability of his tax policy, he demonstrates little understanding of battlefield strategy, because those who are on the receiving end of an artillery barrage seldom stay in place. When businesses and individuals are being bombarded with higher tax rates, they will simply change their behavior. Investors will shift money from taxable to non-taxable investments. Total economic activity slows as there is less incentive for employees to work extra hours, while smaller potential returns mean investors and venture capitalists are less willing to shoulder risk. All taxpayers have a greater incentive to shield their income. Obviously, President Obama is no student of history either, Mr. Speaker. For if he were, he would know revenues increased under Presidents Kennedy, Reagan, and yes, George W. Bush, at least until the 2007 financial crisis when tax rates were reduced. But increasing tax revenue does not appear to be the President's strategic objective. If it were, he would be recommending policies that help increase the revenue base by optimizing the regulatory and tax environment to encourage businesses to invest, grow, and hire. The House of Representatives, Mr. Speaker, has passed 26 bills to do just that, but they currently languish on the desk of Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who will not bring them up for vote in the Senate. Instead, President Obama seems determined to punish and wipe out economic success in this country, leveling tax weapons of mass destruction on all taxpayers. This is a battle our nation can ill afford to lose. We must reform our tax code, and we must restore the conditions for economic success for all our citizens, because truly they are taxed enough already. Mr. Speaker, unleashing the individual industrialism and entrepreneurial spirit of Americans does not come from capital consolidation in Washington, D.C. The American people do not want more cylindrous and GSA boondoggles. The American people want economic security, which comes from this body becoming responsible stewards of their tax resources, not taking more from them based upon divisive socioeconomic rhetoric. The American people, Mr. Speaker, want a constitutional republic, not a socialist, egalitarian, welfare nanny state. The American people want an economic future so bright that they will have to wear sunglasses. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, I thank you, my colleagues, uh, uh, my colleague, for his sentiment and the words uh, that you expressed. And I'm reminded it, that we are here in Washington cannot be like my children, 
when they used to sit in the TV room and watch their cartoons, such as Teletubbies and the other ones that are there. We need to grow up. We need to deal with this issue once and for all. And one thing that I'm repeatedly reminded of when I hear the President's proposal about the top 2% need to pay their fair share, I try to deal with this issue in an open and honest way. And if you do the math on that proposal, you raise $70 billion over 10 years. We have a $1.3 trillion national deficit every year. The math just does not add up. And so I always have to remind people as I engage in this debate about the need for comprehensive tax reform that the solution to our national debt problem is not going to be a revenue solution unless we grow this economy. Raising revenue through increasing taxes is not going to bridge. As my colleague said, mathematically, it is impossible to raise taxes enough to get to that $1.3 trillion number. That's why I'm always reminded that this is a spending problem at its root cause. And that's why we need to continue to focus on that arena. And I will also like to echo my colleague from Florida in his words, essentially, this is going to boil down in this November 2012 election between two strategies of moving forward. And if I heard your statements and your words correctly, we essentially have one strategy that is going to be deployed by my colleagues on the Democratic side on the other side of the aisle that say it needs to be a revenue-based solution. What that is code word back in my living rooms in my district is we're going to raise taxes to deal with this situation. And I think this freshman class and the people that have joined us here on this side of the aisle in the Republican Party have firmly committed that the solution is on downsizing government, cutting spending, adhering to what our founding fathers believed in and put forth in the Constitution, a limited federal government, not an all-encompassing federal government that has grown this debt to the level that we see today. And I am firmly also committed to not engaging in the debate as to who caused it, be it which president from whatever party. That is not the solution moving forward, engaging in the blame game. It is about recognizing the problem is upon us, whoever caused it, Democrat or Republican, and let's solve it. And when we come to November 2012, the American people will not be stupid. They are not stupid individuals. They will see through that the math doesn't add up with a solution based on my colleagues on the other side of the aisle of increasing taxes to bridge this national debt problem. It is about truly being fiscally responsible and getting our fiscal house in order. And does my colleague have any additional comments? I, I just want to say you're absolutely right. And I thank you for yielding just another minute. It is truly the choice between two futures. It is a future of economic freedom or a future of economic dependency. It is a future that talks about the entrepreneurial will and spirit and the individual industrialism of the American people or collective subjugation. And I think that the American people will make the right choice in November 2012. Thank you and I yield back to my colleague. I so appreciate it and I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. At this point in time, I'd like to yield to my good friend, Mr. Holzkamp. Thank you, uh, Congressman Reed. I appreciate the opportunity to visit uh, here, and uh, it's uh, a very timely topic. And I come from western Kansas, and uh, big skies and big dreams and big visions. And, uh, and I tell you, we can see an approaching storm brewing miles away, sometimes 100 miles away. You can see it. You see the dark clouds. You can, see the, you can feel the gusting winds. Though the skies are wide open, sometimes it's hard to predict, predict which path the storm will take. And I tell you, we've heard tonight, and I'll say it again, there's a storm brewing here in Washington that may seem like it's miles, perhaps hundreds of miles away, but it's not. And unlike our Kansas storms, it's pretty evident the storm, this storm is going to hit America. Unless this Congress and this President acts, every American will pay higher taxes next year. Let me rephrase that. Every tax-paying American... Because you know, half of Americans pay no federal income taxes. So I'm talking about the half that actually pay. pay. Income and capital, gain rate, capital gains rates will go up. 
The death tax will go up as well. Child tax credit and standard deductions will de decrease. All of this is certain to happen unless we act. And I, I, I really believe it's been mentioned that this would be the biggest tax increase in American history. I think it actually will, might be the biggest tax increase in human history. It could be. We'll, we'll look forward to those figures. Our economy is just starting to show signs of life again, however weak. Can you imagine what it will mean for the economy if taxes go up at the end of the year? Can you imagine where the stock market is going to go in the final quarter if Congress goes home before the election without acting to extend the lower capital gains rate? I know my colleague Colonel West noted that uh, the president uh, might not be a great student of history. Actually, all he has to do is study his own comments. You go back less than two years ago, the president said, you don't ta raise taxes in a recession. That's President Obama, the president of our country. If he could study his own history, I agree with him. I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but he said, you don't raise taxes in a recession. And sure, we might have emerged from a formal definition of a recession, but I don't think there's anyone out there who believes the economy is growing by leaps or bounds, and, and I don't think you can shoehorn a massive tax increase onto an already overburdened American economy. You just can't. America needs and deserves a tax code that's not premised on pitting American versus American in a class warfare struggle. Unfortunately, that seems to be the only real solution this president has. The so-called Buffett rule is, is only a gimmick. It's just a gimmick, trying to distract the American people from the re reality that he wants the biggest tax increase in American history, and he's going to get it unless we can change this before the end of the year. I proposed uh, a bill to uh, call the American Opportunity and Freedom Act that would make permit, permanent the Bush-Obama tax cuts. Yes, the Bush-Obama tax cuts. Look back at history. This president extended the tax cuts. He signed them. They are the Bush-Obama tax cuts. Remember, he called those tax cuts a substantial, I want to be right here on the quote, a substantial victory for middle class families. This was the President Obama out on the campaign trail today, I believe, saying, we have to extend these tax cuts. I agree. I also support comprehensive reform, including uh, the fair tax. I think my colleague from Georgia is going to visit about that, I hope. I've co-sponsored co the Jobs Through Growth Act and numerous other proposals to make our tax code fairer, flatter, and more simple. The bottom line is we need to do something now. Our tax code should not outpace the Bible in number of words. It certainly doesn't outpace the Bible in wisdom. And families shouldn't have to read 100-page booklets to fill out their tax returns. And if I told, I'm told if you call the IRS, you call it one hour, you call the next hour, you call another hour later, you will get a different answer every time you call in. Because even the folks that are implementing the tax code, they don't know what the answer is. And Americans are out there just doing, trying to do the right thing, trying to do their fair share, Mr. President. Your IRS agents can't even tell them the right answer or the same answer. The most fundamental purpose of the tax code is to raise enough revenue in order to fund essential functions that fall within the purview of government. I just got off a, a, a Skype phone call with fourth and fifth graders in Emporia, Kansas. They had a lot of great questions. Uh, I thought the best question was a kid that asked, I think a young man says, why are taxes so high? Of course, he probably doesn't pay much taxes. He probably heard that at home. But the qu answer I gave him was this, because we spend too much money. And on top of that, we borrow another $1.1 trillion under the, under the Obama budget. And so not only taxes high, they're still borrowing money so they can spend it. It comes down to how much we spend. I think we can agree that Washington problem is not, not enough revenue. It's too much spending. Washington has created this storm. Washington has created the storm, but unlike the tornadoes that sweep across the plains, we have an opportunity to avoid the devastating consequences of the approaching storm that's coming at the end of this year. And I'm excited to be here to talk about that because I must tell you, I am optimistic. We can solve this problem. We can take advantage of the approaching storm and actually do comprehensive tax reform that can change the future for all Americans. We can pull this economy out of the doldrums, go back to the days when the economy actually grew, when jobs were being created. But in today's environment, the uncertainty created by this administration and by tax law that's not permanent, that is dragging down our economy. We can't avoid that. We can do much better, and I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about that. And I yield back my time. Well, I thank you so much, uh, my colleague from um, Kansas, for coming down this evening to talk.
about this issue, and you are exactly right. When I listened to the comments you had to offer, and as we go into this debate about comprehensive tax reform, I think there's, a, there's somewhat of an agreement on both sides of the aisle that tax reform needs to be done because our tax code is way too complicated. 70,000 pages of tax regulation and statutory language, legislation on top of legislation. We need to firmly attack that tax code in a way that focuses on the primary goal of what our tax code was originally enacted for, to raise revenue, not to engage in policy determination or picking winners or losers through the tax code and advancing social policy uh, through the tax code, but focusing on a tax code that raises revenue to cover our lawful, legitimate government expense as put forth in the United States Constitution of a limited federal government. And if we adhere to that principle and that goal, I am confident that both sides of this aisle will come together and achieve what could be one of those historical moments in this chamber again, where we set the country on a path to a more competitive and prosperous future moving forward. And with that, does the gentleman from Kansas like to If I might ask you a question, uh, Congressman, uh, have, you, have you read the entire tax code? <laughs> I have tried. I've read numerous parts of it, especially when I'm up late at night and I can't sleep. It seems like it is the panacea for uh, those sleepless nights because it immediately puts me back to bed. It probably would be my guess that there isn't a single colleague of ours that has read this tax code. Now there's some, probably some special attorneys in this town that uh, claim to read, it, read that whole tax code. As you mentioned, how many pages? 70,000 70,000 pages. It's my understanding it's three and a half times the size of the Bible, perhaps. Longer all Shakespeare's works. And it's all about to be centralizing power in Washington. We have a grand opportunity, I, I agree. With challenges come opportunities. We have a tremendous opportunity. And it will have to be a bipartisan opportunity. I agree with you. We have to have the president propose a solution, and his only solution right now is let's just raise taxes, or God forbid, just let them go up automatically. If he does nothing, if he refuses to help us make America more competitive, if he refuses to help us, we have, as you mentioned, the single largest tax increase in American history, and we can't stop him if he's not willing to, to help out. But I, I, I think the American people are demanding comprehensive tax reform. They're demanding us to get this right, because we cannot afford the massive tax increases in the current law. And, and I, I'm very fearful about that, but I am optimistic that we can and will do the right thing, especially when we have to look, you know, I, I got a friend of mine in, in Junction City, Kansas, met him in a town hall. His name was Tom, or is Tom, and, uh, and he's a small business owner. And he said, you know, I am going to start a small business, or I would, but because of those tax increases at the end of the year, I'm not going to do that. And he said, I would have hired seven people. Those seven people not hired in Junction City, Kansas, don't show up in any list. But they show up in Junction City of seven more people, seven families that don't have the income they need. And they probably end up having to have some government assistance or getting help from the church and their neighbors. But those are things that get lost that we can't forget in this town. It's not about us. It's not about, it's not about special interests. It's about the American people and getting this economy going again. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about that. And the, the common goal of those of us sitting in the chamber tonight is to get this economy moving again and actually being competitive internationally. So I appreciate your leadership on that, uh, Congressman Reed, and a fantastic job here tonight. Well, I so appreciate the, my gentleman's comments, and I appreciate those kind words. And as we move forward, I'd like to uh, bring a good friend of ours from Wisconsin uh, into this conversation who has been a stalwart uh, down here on the House floor and joins us numerous times on these uh, opportunities that we have a chance to debate the issues of the day. And with that, Mr. Duffy, I am, it's an honor to yield you time. And I appreciate the gentleman from uh, New York yielding. You know, as uh, we talk about these issues, and I've been listening today as my uh, colleagues have been discussing uh, the tax policy, but if you take a step back, you look at all the different rules and regulations and bills that have taken place over the course of the last three and a half years. It's a, it's a torrential rain. And uh, we have to take almost a raindrop by raindrop uh, looking at each policy, each rule, each uh, uh, law that's going into effect. And I want to take a moment uh, to step back from the tax debate and first start with the conversation in regard to the budget. Because uh, I think most Americans that I talk to, they're, they're, they're very nervous about what's happening with this ever-expanding government, but ever-expanding debt. 
Many Americans know we owe now $15.6 trillion. Uh, they know we've borrowed a, a trillion dollars every year for the last three years. And so they will step back and go, well, what's the plan? How do we address this uh, really difficult problem? I, I know uh, a lot of the moms in my district, uh, they're concerned about uh, who's lending us that money as the Chinese. They're concerned about their kids that they're raising so well, are uh, educating so well, what kind of an America they're going to grow up in. And so they say, listen, what kind of budget are you going to have? How are you going to fix it? And if they were to look uh, to the Senate, they would look and see that for the past three years, the Senate wasn't willing to pass a budget. They weren't willing to put out a plan on how they would deal with this daunting issue that this country faces. If they were uh, to look over to the president, and as the president, how do you deal with this, this cancer that's growing in America, which is our debt? How do you deal with it? I think they'd say, well, Mr. Mr. President, you've given us a budget, but it's a budget that never balances. It's a budget that includes all the tax increases you've ever discussed, but it doesn't balance. It's a budget that we brought to this House floor, and it was such a political document that doesn't accomplish the goals that the, uh, the, the moms and dads of America want accomplished that uh, not one Republican nor one Democrat voted for that budget. We need real ideas to be put on the table. We need bold leadership to, ad to address the large issues that we face in this country. And for the last two years, the House Republicans have given that bold leadership. We've been willing to put our ideas on the, on the table on how we fix the great problems of our generation. And I'm proud of our freshman class. I'm proud of our House Republicans for willing to step out and lead. And part of that leadership has been a reform of our tax system, our tax code, making it more competitive and more fair. And I want to talk about that a little bit, which is the conversation tonight. I think many Americans may not know this, but as of April 1st, April Fool's Day, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. And that's because the Japanese on April 1st were the last ones to lower their taxes, making us the highest tax country. That's a problem. We find ourselves in a, in a situation in America where uh, one party is asking for a more competitive tax code that will encourage investment and growth in America. We have the other side, which is the president's side that encourages, under the auspices of fairness, that we increase taxes. And as I talk to people back at home, these conversations oftentimes come up. And I'll ask my, my uh, friends at home, I'll say, listen, well, if, um, if you look at businesses in America, can you name a few of them that don't pay taxes? Are there a few businesses here that you can identify that don't pay taxes? And virtually everyone in a town hall will shake their head and go, yeah, nah, I can name that business that doesn't pay taxes. So I'll ask them. Well, if you want that business to pay taxes, if you were just willing to raise the tax rate from 35% up to 40%, which is what the president wants to do, will that business that's in your head that doesn't pay taxes, will they now pay taxes if you just increase the rate by five percentage points? No! The tax code is broken for generations. Long before I got here, I was riding my trike when people were carving out special interests in the tax code. 70,000 pages in a tax code that's for special interests, special loopholes. The people in my district don't take advantage of those 70 pages. It's for the special interests that come to this town day after day and ask to carve themselves out. What have we done? We in this house have said, that's not fair. That's not right. Let's carve them all back in. Let's reduce the complexity of the tax code, bring all these people back in, and make them, yes, pay their fair share. What we've said that we can do is take the top rate from 35% and bring it down to 25%, and then the other rates down to 10%. And if you do that by eliminating all the loopholes in the code, you'll bring in more revenue, and it'll be fair. Doesn't that make sense? Raising rates doesn't accomplish it. Reforming the tax code is where we have to go. Let's get a bipartisan group together, carve out those special interests, reduce the rates, and make us more competitive. You know, we hear a lot about the Buffett tax, right? It's a, it's a tax on investment income. And 
listen, there's two different kinds of income. You have the income that you get uh, from your salary, your salary income, that's taxed at a certain rate. You're guaranteed to get that every week or every two weeks because you put your 40 or 80 hours in and, and that, uh, that paycheck comes to you and you're guaranteed to get it. But there's also investment income. In, in America and around the world, investment income is taxed at a little bit lower rate. And you say, well, why? Why would that be taxed at a lower rate? Well, the reason is if you invest 10000 let's say you invest $100,000, you're not guaranteed to make anything on that $100,000. Actually, you might lose the whole investment. You might lose that $100,000. But if you're lucky enough, or you're smart enough, or savvy enough to make some money on that $100,000 investment, we said you should, you should have a tax rate that's a little bit less than that which is guaranteed on the salary. And so we have a little less of a tax rate on investment income. But there's something else. We want to encourage investment in America. Because we know if we're investing in our infrastructure, in our manufacturing facilities, in our businesses, if we have investment, what happens? We create jobs. There's job growth in America when you have investment in America. And we want to make sure this is a great home for investment. And if you raise the taxes on investment, you will get less of it. Let's make sure we have a great investment tax rate so money around the world wants to pour into this country and take advantage of one of the best workforces in the world, which is right here in America. One other point I want to make before I yield back to the gentleman. There's a lot of people who talk about raising taxes to bring in more revenue. I think it's important that we're very clear that when people are talking about raising taxes to bring in more revenue to pay down the debt, that's not what's happening. People are asking to raise taxes to spend more money. There is no effort to reduce spending in this, in this town. Those who want to increase taxes want to spend more. They don't want to spend less. But if you wanted to actually bring in more money to the federal coffers, you should look at tax history. Because every time we're raising tax rates, there's not a correlation in bringing more money into the federal coffers. Raising tax rates doesn't mean more money. What does mean more money into the federal coffers is a growing economy. If you can grow your economy, if you can put your people back to work, more people pay taxes. And if more people pay taxes, more money comes into the federal coffers, and we have more dollars to pay down our debt. But not only that, there's less people on food stamps and energy assistance because they have a job. This is some common sense reform that this group uh, in the House is talking about. And if we could just implement it, take the weight of a burdensome tax code off the shoulders of our entrepreneurs and our job creators and our investors, we can see expansive growth, explosive growth. I look forward to being part of a team who's willing to engage in a great debate to make sure we are, again, the most competitive and best place in the country to invest. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman from New York. Well, I, I thank the gentleman so much from Wisconsin for joining us and, and the sentiment and the words that you've expressed. And you know what? As we go into the election and as we go into November 2012, I think what we're articulating on the House floor tonight as we're having this conversation about tax reform is that there are some differences that the American people are going to be able to choose between. And one of the fundamental differences when it comes to tax policy is I see a base philosophy differential between my colleagues on the other side of the aisle from the Democratic Party and those of us on this side of the aisle in the Republican Party. And that base differential in philosophy is that what I hear from my Democratic colleagues on the other side of the aisle when they propose such things as let's increase taxes on the top 2% or this group or that group, it's a fundamental belief I would submit that they believe that that money is better given to them here in Washington, D.C. to then dole out as they in Washington, D.C. feel is appropriate. And the philosophy on this side of the aisle that I am firmly committed to, and I'm sure many of my colleagues uh, here tonight are firmly committed to, is that that money are the individual's money. They are the American citizens' money. They are the ones who earned it. They are the ones who punched the clock around the hour 24-7 or 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon or midnight till 8, 8 a.m. 
they're the ones that are earning that money, and that is their money. And the more that we can keep that money that they earned as citizens and individuals in their pocket, they will do the right thing. We believe in the individual. And from the arguments that I've heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I would say that they differ in that opinion. They truly do believe that Washington should be the judge of where those resources go because for some odd reason they sit here in Washington and come up with, try to come up with one-size-fits-all answers to the problems of the day. And it fundamentally is a philosophy that that money is Washington, D.C.'s money and not the individual's. And with that, I'd like to uh, bring our colleague in from Georgia, who I know is a strong a advocate, Mr. Woodall, of uh, the fair tax uh, proposal that's been out there and that's being debated. And that is one of the things uh, that I have to say about this freshman class, is that we have changed the culture of Washington, D.C., and that we are going to allow all alternatives to be on the table and have an open and honest conversation with all of America about reforms that are going forward and then going forward in a way that solve our nation's problem and everyone will be given a fair shake to express those ideas and I'm sure my colleague from Georgia is rising today to offer his insight and his proposal as to an alternative to the income tax structure that we presently exist under and that would be the fair tax. And if I'm wrong on that, I apologize to the gentleman from Georgia, but knowing his reputation and his words uh, around this town, I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit about that. And with that, I yield uh, to the gentleman from Georgia. I appreciate my friend uh, from New York uh, for yielding. You're absolutely right. I have some fair tax passion. I, I believe that there's a better way to, to create a United States tax code. I believe the fair tax is that. It's H.R. 25 for, for folks who haven't read it. But the truth is, I, I came down here tonight because I knew we were going to have that debate of ideas that you're talking about. I mean, whether it's your leadership on this special order, uh, whether it's the enthusiasm my friend from, from Wisconsin uh, brings to the floor, we're talking about the challenges that we face using a different language than we use in this body before. I mean, this is the floor that's been taken over by freshmen uh, here tonight. And this is an institution that's been taken over by new ideas. And I don't mean just, just new freshman ideas. I mean new ideas from all uh, aspects of, of this institution. I hear my friend from Wisconsin talking, and my friend from Wisconsin says... And, and he comes from a competitive district. I mean, there's all this talk about these rabid uh, freshman uh, crazy uh, Republicans. The people of Wisconsin, they can choose anybody they want. They don't have to choose a Republican. They can choose a Democrat. They can choose an independent. They can choose anybody they want. And they choose him. And his message is not, look what I'm going to go to Washington and get for you. His message is, we don't need a subsidy here because we've got the hardest working workforce in the world. His message is, how can I give you, is not, how can I give you an unfair advantage over your neighbors? His message is, how can we make the American economy the most competitive economy in the world? Because if we do that, the American worker will succeed because we work harder and better and longer than anybody else on the planet. That is a different take on what happens in Washington, D.C., and it's a different take on what happens in the tax code. You know, I, I know my friend from New York uh, sits on the powerful uh, Ways and Means Committee, as does my friend from from Tennessee, and you have to have a Ways and Means Committee. For folks uh, who don't sit on that committee, they're the ones who write all the tax code. The tax code's a complicated thing to do. But what this Ways and Means Committee is doing, and it's important to be said because this is an election year, and a lot of crazy things happen in election year, crazy things like people supporting a Buffett rule to solve deficit problems, a, a rule that, that if it had been in place this year and collected that same amount of revenue for the next 250 years, it still would not have balanced the budget from last year. That's right. This, this great savior of all that's good, that ails us in this, this country, President Obama's Buffett rule, had it been in place this year, and not just this year, but the next 250 years it had raised that revenue, it still would not have balanced the budget from last year, just the budget gap from last year. So we have all this nonsense in a, in a political year. But what we're getting out of the Ways and Means Committee, and I know my two friends from the Ways and Means Committee wouldn't brag on themselves, so I'm going to brag on, you, uh, brag on you for you. We have had more serious hearings about fundamental tax reform in this Ways and Means Committee over the last 16 months than we've had in the last decade. This is a committee that, by virtue of simplifying the American tax code, is going to undo the work of the Ways and Means Committee for decades and decades and decades in the past. But they're doing it not to 
exploit the power of their position. They're doing it to help grow the American economy. As an alternative to the Buffett rule, I, I brought down a chart to demonstrate what happens in today's tax code. My friends on the Ways and Means Committee know it, know it all too well. But in today's tax code, the folks who have the money benefit from all the loopholes and exceptions and exemptions and carve out. Of course they do. It makes sense. I, I'll tell you the folks who have the money are the ones who are paying the taxes. So it certainly makes sense that they're the ones benefiting from the carve out. So we have a choice of two futures here. We can either implement the President's Buffett rule, which again, by simple mathematics, uh, will have absolutely no effect either on growing the economy or paying down the deficit, or we can simplify today's tax code to make it flatter and fairer. And that's what my friends in the Ways and Means Committee have been working on, Chairman Dave Camp and the rest of the committee, in ways that I have never seen before, with a sincerity that I have never seen before. And you're absolutely right, and I appreciate my friend from New York for saying it. They said, bring all comers. Bring all comers. We're not the smartest people in the room. If the idea comes from Lawrenceville, Georgia, bring it. If it comes from, from Seneca, New York, bring it. If it comes from Chattanooga, Tennessee, bring it. We want all the ideas. And we'll just let the chips fall where they may. That's what's different in this town, I say to my colleague. What is different in this town with this Republican class is we don't have to rig the game to get to the outcome. We just bring the debates to the floor. Bring the facts to the floor. Let the facts speak themselves. And then guess what? Have a vote. And if it's a good idea, it wins. If it's a bad idea, it loses. We see both of those happen on this floor every day. And the Ways and Means Committee is leading in this tax process. This would have been a great year for the Ways and Means Committee, putting my political hat on for a moment, a great year for you all to play some sort of game with the tax code. I've seen it happen in Congress's past. Oh, this is going to be good for re-election. We're going to go do X, Y, or Z. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be real, but we're going to play the game. The folks on this committee this year, the freshmen in this body this year, would rather lose in November having tried each and every day to do the right thing than win in November having played the game the way it's been played for so many years. So serious is the effort in the Ways and Means Committee that it was included in the House passed budget this year. Flatter, fairer rates, eliminating exemptions, loopholes, carve-outs, all of those things that, that the American people look at and lose faith in this body You've stood up to them all. You've stood up to them all in the Ways and Means Committee. We've stood up to them in the Budget Committee to say no more. There's a better way, and we're going to share it with the American people. I appreciate uh, my colleague for, for taking on the time uh, tonight, and I, I ask him to commit uh, this chart to memory. I say to all my other colleagues who might be watching back in their offices on budget.house.gov, you'll find myriad uh, charts to talk about all the things that my friend from Wisconsin discussed, that my friend from Kansas uh, discussed, that my friend from Florida discussed, to lay them out in, in, in easy to, to see and, and visualize ways. But if we want to get a handle on what's happening in America with the discrepancies, we call it fairness, call it economic growth, you name your ill, a flatter and fairer tax code is the beginning of that solution. It's not the end. But the tax code was not designed to implement social policy. It was designed to collect revenue so that we can run the national defense of this country. And if we get back there, if we get back there, the American economy and the American taxpayer is going to be the beneficiary. And I thank my friend for his leadership tonight. Well, I so appreciate the gentleman from Georgia and, and the uh, expression and sentiment you bring to the floor and the passion that you bring to the floor on, on this issue and all the issues that you, you bring to our attention. And you are so right. We are committed to having an open and honest debate with all of America. Because the American hardworking taxpayer deserves no less. We are here to do what needs to be done. We are here to lead. And that's why I appreciate my colleague from Georgia on the Budget Committee, because I know there was some political heat put on that Budget Committee to back away from coming up with a budget that we could stand for in this chamber. But we took the stand and you took the stand as part of that budget committee to say you know what we are not going to engage in the politics of old we are not going to be afraid to lead because the problems that face us in America today are generational they are the same level threats that generations before us faced and that most recent example possibly that jumps to the top of my mind is World War II 
when the real fate of the American government, the American symbol of freedom and democracy, was at risk with a threat from Europe with fascism and the, exp and the expressions coming out of that area of the world. And what did America do? And that's the history lesson I bring to this chamber tonight. America leadership, our president, our leaders, did not look to divide America on that issue. That leadership led by uniting America to come together to face that generational threat and survive so that the America that they had could be passed on to our generation and this generation and grandchildren's generations to come so they have the opportunity to succeed and take care and live that American dream. It is time for our nation to come together, not be divided. And I am very confident, because I have faith in the American individual, that come November 2012, the American people will make the right call. And between the choices that will be clearly articulated between both sides of this aisle, we will see what needs to be done, and the right decisions will be made. And we will overcome this generational crisis that faces us in our national debt and this economy that is bogged down in stagnation, debt, doubt, and despair. And we will overcome it because failure is not an alternative. And with that, I'd love to yield to a great lady on the Ways and Means Committee, a fellow freshman, and a good friend, uh, Ms. Black from Tennessee. And thank you, uh, Mr. Reed, for yielding to me. And I want to thank you as a fellow member of Ways and Means and a freshman for bringing us together tonight for this special order. This is such an important issue, and the American people really need to hear that there is a choice. There's a choice between a system or a, a, a plan that is going to take more money out of the pockets of our hard-working taxpayers or one that's going to put more money in those pockets and make a system that is fairer, flatter, and simpler. As I traveled throughout my district over the last 16 months now, um, I've continued to hear from my businesses in particular that there is so much uncertainty out there, and I ask them, what is the uncertainty? What is it that's keeping you awake at night, that keeps you from growing your business, and as a result of that, creating more jobs? Obviously, when people have jobs, they have money in their pocket, and what do they do when they have money in their pocket? They spend that money, and they spend that money to buy other products and services, which means that the economy grows. And what they tell me is there are really three things. One is they feel like they don't know when a new mandate is going to come down, such as the health care, and that's going to cost them money. Uh, they also don't know when we're going to put another regulation on them, and many of the businesses are very burdened by regulations that, frankly, those are not the same regulations that you see when they do take their businesses offshore, which means we are just driving them offshore. And the third is the one we're here tonight to talk about, and that is tax. Um, we have heard in a number of our hearings in Ways and Means that all the way from the corporate tax down to the individual tax and the pass-through tax that many of our small businesses use, that they are willing to give up those deductions and loopholes um, that are currently in the tax code to get something that is fair, flatter, and simpler. This tax code has not been reformed in 25 years. What it has had is a lot of things that have added to it. And with everything that's added to it, it only complicates it more, but it does something else. It picks winners and losers. And by having a tax reform that would make things fairer, flatter, and simpler, we wouldn't be picking winners and losers. It is far too complicated. You know, most of the American people don't realize that the United States has the highest corporate tax in the world. As of April 1, when Japan lowered their corporate tax, we became, oh, I don't know that we we'll want to be very proud of this, but we became the country that has the highest corporate income tax. Talk about driving people offshore. So in our tax reform, we bring the corporate income tax down to a level that is an average for all of the um, countries that we do trade with and that we are in competition with, and we bring it down to 25%. We do something that makes sense. It's a common sense reform. Um, likewise, when we take a look at our other businesses that are not the large businesses that are corporations, but the small businesses, and there are about 60% of the small businesses are passed through. That means they're in the individual um, tax system. 
Am, am I hearing that we're out of time? <laughs> we are coming to our uh, end of time. <laughs> okay. Well, if, if I may then just conclude with a couple of words. If, I would if, uh, greatly if you may uh, yield be honored to yield to my colleague okay. from Tennessee for um, closing comment. So flatter, fairer, and simpler. But I'm going to bring this back to a time where I served in the state legislature. And the state income tax at that point in time, I, because it was, I, I think that I hear a gavel that says I am done whether I wish to be done Under or not. Under the Speaker's so announced policy of January 5, 2011, the, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to um, thank the leader for the opportunity to take this hour to discuss some extremely important issues here in the United States. We've just listened to an hour discussion on taxes with actually very, very little specificity as to whose taxes are being cut and exactly what those tax cuts would mean to the American economy and to the people of America. Uh, normally, when we take the floor, as we do uh, most every week on the issue of the American economy, we talk about making it in America, rebuilding the great American manufacturing uh, industry. We've seen over the last 20 years that the American manufacturing industry has declined by some 40, 45 percent from just under 20 million Americans in manufacturing to just over 11 and a half. In the recent months, we've seen a resurgence of the American manufacturing sector, but nonetheless, it is still very, very small compared to what it once was. If we're going to rebuild the American economy, we do have to rebuild the American manufacturing sector. Uh, I'm going to come back to this tax debate here very, very quickly, uh, but I think we ought to put it in the context of what taxes mean to the American economy, which taxes can be cut, and which could be raised. Uh, and the key issues in building the American economy are here on this chart. Uh, taxes being one of the second pieces. But the rest of them are also important. International trade issues, for example, how do we deal with China and the China currency issue? How do we deal with uh, the importation of extraordinary amounts of material, equipment, and goods, while at the same time exporting even less and less. How do we deal with that? The energy issue is exceedingly important if we're going to rebuild the American economy. Labor issues, how do we prepare the American uh, labor market? That is, the men and women that work in America. Oh, by the way, I, I heard something here from my colleagues on the Republican side that just drives me crazy. When they say that half of Americans don't pay taxes, then they say, oh, we mean income taxes. Let's understand that every American worker, up to those who earn $106,000, pay 6 plus percent, almost 7 percent, excuse me, 8 percent of their total income in taxes. That's the withholding tax. And by the way, it was the Democrats who actually reduced the Social Security withholding tax to uh, half of what it was uh, in previous years. So let's understand that every American worker pays taxes. Now the income tax issue is another matter and we'll come to that in a few moments, but Americans who work pay taxes and let's not forget that in this discussion. In any case, labor is a major issue. This issue of education is now very much being discussed in America, and I want to really focus on that during this one-hour discussion. Research, critical to the future of America's economy, and finally, the infrastructure upon which all of this is built. These are the issues that the Democrats have taken up in building and restarting, reigniting the American dream, reigniting the American dream so that men and women in this country can get a decent job, earn enough to be in the middle class, and raise their families, own a home if they want to own a home, take a vacation when they need to have one or want to have one, and be able to have health care so they needn't worry about bankruptcy, which 
is in this nation caused more than 60% of the time by health care and health care problems. So trade, taxes, energy, labor, education, research, and infrastructure are the key issues in reigniting the American dream and rebuilding the American economy. Uh, tax is a major portion of this, and I don't want to forget about taxes. We just heard this one-hour discussion about it. The question is, who is taxed and who gets the tax benefits? Less than a month ago, our Republican colleagues put on the floor of this House their blueprint for the American economy, their blueprint for how we are going to use government or reduce government, their blueprint on how we are going to raise the tax revenue necessary for the operations of the government. Very, very interesting, because essentially what they have done is to take money away from education and give money to the wealthiest of Americans, those who earn more than a million dollars a year, would, under the Republican blueprint on taxes, pay less and less. Actually, they would see a tax reduction. Remember, those whose adjusted gross income is over a million dollars a year would pay less taxes. They would get a tax break of $394,000 a year minimum. Now, if you're a billionaire, the tax cut would be in the millions and millions of dollars. Is that fair? I think not. We just heard fair tax on the floor. I must tell you that the Republican proposal in their blueprint voted out of the House of Representatives. Now the blueprint for the Republican action on this year's and future budgets and appropriations would reduce the taxes for millionaires by $394,000. For billionaires, millions and millions of additional reductions in their taxes. That is not fair. What we on the Democratic side have proposed is to make certain that the elements that lead to a growing economy and a just society are in place. Let's talk specifically about education. In the previous Congress, the Democrats took up education and said this is a fundamental element in economic growth and social justice. The opportunity to get to the middle class is largely dependent upon the education that a person is able to receive in the K through 12 system and in higher education. Specific steps were taken for those in low income communities whose schools are unacceptable. Uh, specific money was put to those schools through the Title I programs so that they could raise up the standards of education and provide those who do not have the family support, those that do not have the economic support, to be able to get a decent education in K through 12. Much, much more needs to be done. But that was put in place by the Democrats in the last Congress. Take a look at the blueprint that passed this House not more than a month ago, the Republican blueprint for the future. Cut Title I. Pull that money away from those low-income communities where the necessity of education must be available to every one of those students. Higher education. Another example. In the previous Congress, controlled by the Democrats in this House, the Senate and the President, there was a significant improvement, expansion, of the Pell Grants. This is money given to low-income and, and uh, middle-class families to assist them in going to higher education. Expansion, yes. Community college and part-time students for the first time covered, given the opportunity to get a Pell Grant so that they can improve themselves in the community college or in higher education four-year programs. From, four, from a little over $4,000 to $5,500 increase, as well as an expansion of those who were eligible. Very important in providing the educational opportunity that students must have if they're going to succeed in a highly competitive world economy. Secondly, interest rates on student loans. Most every student now attending school 
high, a higher education, takes out a loan. The interest rates on those loans were over 6.5%. Now, we did two things as Democrats. We took away from the banks who were ripping the students off, the student loan program, put it back into the government, saving billions upon billions of dollars every year, and then reinvested that money back into lowering the interest rates for the students. Not a bad thing from 6.5% six and six and interest rate down to 3.4% interest rate. All of this designed to make it easier for students who have to take out loans to be able to pay back those debts over time. We also did a couple of other things for students who had taken out loans. Low income and middle income families. We changed the way and the timing in which the loans needed to be repaid. We said, you're going to have to pay no more than 15% of that loan each year of your discretionary income. That is the income over and above food and shelter and clothing. Giving students a longer period of time and having to devote less of their money to pay back the student loans. My colleague uh, who will be joining me in a few moments will discuss this in more detail. In addition to that, we made it possible for the educational system to receive additional money for this fundamental economic development called research. We increased the research for health care, for mental health, for um, agriculture, for energy. All of those things are the essence of today's and tomorrow's economy, research being necessary. Now, what did the Republicans do? In their blueprint, voted on by 100% of the Republicans. This was their budget, sometimes called the Ryan Republican budget. Every one of those things that we put in place to assist students in getting an education was dramatically and drastically reduced, while at the same time taking money away from students and handing that money to the oil industry and to the millionaires, the multimillionaires, the billionaires. Remember, a minimum tax reduction for millionaires of $392,000 a year, while at the same time taking money out of the pockets of students, increasing, not just increasing, but doubling the interest rate on student loans from 3.4 to 6.8 percent, costing every student more than $1,000 a year in additional interest payments on their loans. That's the average. Now, those that are above average, that number is going to go much higher. Pell Grants, reducing the Pell Grants, eliminating from the opportunity to get a Pell Grant more than a million students over the next 10 years, nearly 400,000 students in the United States would be immediately see a reduction in their Pell Grants in the year ahead and 100,000 not being able to get a Pell Grant at all. This is economic fairness? I don't think so. This is wise economic policy? I don't think so. Giving to the wealthiest 1% in this country, an enormous tax break and taking it directly out of the pockets of students is bad economic policy. It's bad policy for education and it will not reignite the American dream. In fact, it will stifle that American dream and we will not stand for that. We Democrats are rising up and saying, no, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to give to the super wealthy, the billionaires and millionaires, while taking money away from the students of America. This is an important issue. This is not only an issue about economic fairness. This is an issue about growing the American economy. And we know where we stand. We stand for educating the workforce so that they can compete. Now, joining me is a gentleman from the great state of De Michigan, who uh, represents Detroit, who has been on this issue from his very first day here in Congress. Hanson Clark, I know you want to jump in, so have at it. Oh, thank you so much. I want to thank my colleague, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, for yielding me time. My message to our colleagues in the House of Representatives is very clear and direct. We've got